tonight. Thank you for your children. Thank you for our members. Thank you for our leaders. And thank you for those who are invited and they have come. I pray, Lord, you touch every heart tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. And I pray that this word will search our hearts. Amen. This word will saturate our lives. Amen. And the world will pray for us for glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray, Lord, you keep us awake. Amen. Give us the spirit of understanding Amen. that your word will enrich every life in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We're studying the epistle of Jude to the church. That is the general epistle of Jude. And for those who are coming for the first time, I need to tell you that we study the Bible from book to book. And from chapter to chapter. And from verse to verse. And for those of us who have been coming before, I still need to remind you of that. So that you understand, whatever comes, that's what the Lord wants us to understand. It's what he wants us uh, to prepare us for glory. That's the reason we're studying. And so if anything is said that appears to you personal, that appears to you that's direct, that appears as if, how is the pastor saying that? I'm not saying anything. We're just looking at the Bible and thank God that the Spirit of God is talking to you. That means you're a real child of God. The Father must talk to the children. And if you're a child of God, the Lord will talk to you. And whatever he says, you will do it in Jesus' name. We're coming to Jude chapter 1, only one chapter, I'm reading from verse 11. It says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for a watch, and perished in the gainsaying of Corin. These are spots in your feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, Trees whose fruits withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, reaching waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the servants from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh. With ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words of swelling words, and then having men's admiration, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Those are the verses we're looking at today, and the subject we're considering is the description and the destiny of the unrighteous. The description and the destiny of the unrighteous. As you look at all the verses, it gives us three names. It gives us the name of Cain, and the name of Balaam, and the name of Cori. Actually, it's Korah in the Old Testament. And it says that these are sinners, these are righteous people, and these are people that did not retain the grace of God in their lives. And they perished eventually. And the Lord is showing us this and teaching us this so that we'll not follow their pattern, we'll not follow their lifestyle, we will not follow what they did so that we'll not have the same judgment like they had. And that begins to give us general, a general description of people who are unrighteous, general description of people who are sinners, general description of people who are on their way to perdition on their way to darkness forever and ever. And he tells us about them. He uses uh, symbols about the sea. 
about the ocean and about the waves and the wind and you see the symbol of the tree you see so all kinds of symbols so as to tell us that as you look at an unrighteous man as you look at a sinful man as you look at a backslider as you look at somebody on his way to hellfire on his way to perdition on his way to eternal darkness there's nothing good at all to say about them again is reminding us if this is the way of the wicked if this is the way of the sinner he wants us to understand that is the wrong way that's a way that leads to judgment and you don't want to follow that way you want to follow the way of the lord and if you are today following the path of unrighteousness and the path of sinning the lord is calling you and the lord is saying come back and the Lord is saying repent and the Lord is saying change your mind and the Lord is saying change the direction of your life so that you will not perish with the unbelievers you will not perish with the righteous you will not perish with the sinners and I pray that this study will turn every one of us around in the right direction in Jesus name give me a good a solo amen there the description and the destiny of the unrighteous. There are three things we're looking at as we divide the passage to three parts. Number one, the pride and the presumption of uncontrollable self-seekers. The pride and the presumption of self-seekers that are uncontrollable. Even God couldn't direct them. Even the angels couldn't direct them. They were uncontrollable. They will not change. They will not turn. The word of God might come to them or God might speak to them directly. Still, they will persist in their evil way. That's the way of destruction. The pride and the presumption of uncontrollable self-seekers. Point number two, the peril and the punishment of unrepentant souls. The peril and the punishment of unrepentant souls that means no matter how many messages they hear they don't repent no matter what warnings they hear they don't repent no matter what exhortation what admonition they receive they don't repent no matter the height and no matter the understanding no matter the level of the person helping them counseling them admonishing them exhorting them and talking to them that this is the right way still they will shake their heads and they say no i want to go my own way and they do not repent there's peril when you persist to sin and there is danger when you persist in evil, the peril and the punishment of unrepentant souls. And then we come to point number three, the perversion and the profanity of ungodly sinners. The perversion, they turn right things upside down, make it evil. And it turns something good to bad, make it evil. And it turns something that ought to be righteous, something that should be in the right way, very straightforward. They turn all that around, they pervert everything. They pervert the word of God. They pervert the will of God. They pervert the way of God. They pervert the wisdom of God. They pervert the revelation of God. They turn everything upside down and then profanity. That is the language that is profane, the language that is defiling, the language that instead of building people up and shining light into their lives, the language is profane. They are ungodly sinners, the perversion and profanity of ungodly sinners. Number one, what's number one over there? The pride and the presumption of uncontrollable self-seekers. Look at this. We're looking at Jude. And we're reading from verse 11. Jude. I'm reading from verse 11. It tells us, woe unto them, sorrow unto them, perdition, judgment unto them, eternal suffering unto them. But why? It says because they have gone in the way of Cain. That's number one. Number two, it says they ran greedily after the error of Balaam. Number three, it says they perished in the gain sin, in the rebellion, in the conspiracy, in the, in the opposition of Corinth. 
it gives us three people there and you look at them one by one we're looking at genesis chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 5 genesis chapter 4 we're looking at verse 5 this is a person that uh, pretended he wanted to worship god but he will not worship god in the way god has ordained in the way god has stipulated in the way god has taught in the way god has revealed he will go his own way and he will say god is all i can give to you if that pleases you right if it doesn't please you that's all right but I, i'm going to do my way when you want to worship the lord you worship the lord in the way he has ordained he has ordained the way of worshiping the Lord the Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Behold that sacrifice, the final sacrifice. Behold that substitute. He died for you. Behold the sin bearer. He wants to take all your sins away. Behold the Savior. And if you deviate from that and you say, no, the Lamb is not going to be my substitute. It's not going to be my sin bearer. It's not going to be my sacrifice it's not going to be my savior whatever else you may do in the worship is not acceptable in the sight of the lord that's why we're looking at uh, genesis chapter 4 and i'm reading here from verse 3 it says and in the process of time it came to pass that cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the lord you must remember this chapter 4 in chapter 3 the ground had been cursed and the fruit of the hand of man had been caused. You cannot take what is cursed out of the cursed ground and then appease God to remove the curse away from your life. It has to be something else. And that's why Abel brought a lamb. Abel bought, brought something that has the blood because the blood has been given as an atonement for your soul. And then look at this in verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. The Lord did not accept him. There are many people who are worshiping today, but the Lord does not accept the worship because they are not going through Jesus Christ. They are going through a candle. They're going through incense. They're going through the works of their hands. They're going through water baptism. They're going through confirmation. They're going through giving money to the beggars. They go into the works of their own hand. All your righteousness is filled the racks in the sight of the Lord. But you come, you say, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Rock of ages, play for me. Let me hide myself in thee. What can wash away my sin? Tell me, church. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can take away my stain? Tell me, church. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, the precious flow of the blood of Jesus Christ, it comes over your soul, comes over your mind, and it washes you and cleanses you. But you know, in the case of Cain, no, he will not bring something that God wants. And so the Lord said, if you've done well, I would accept you. And if you've not done well, the sin of rain is still at the door. And you can still make right what was wrong. But no, he will not do that. What he did was to kill Abel. And then the Bible commands about him. He was angry at the righteous. He was angry at the redeemed. He was angry at the one that had been accepted of the Lord. In First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, we're looking at verse 12. It says, Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his own brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his works were evil, and his brother's righteous. His works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Do you hate the righteous? Do you hate the people of God? Somebody who has salvation, who is rejoicing in that salvation, he has victory, he has triumph. And he says, praise the Lord, I overcome self, I overcome sin, I overcome Satan, I overcome the world, I rejoice in the glory of God and the grace of God. And then anger rises up in your heart, you have the relative of Cain. Because that's what happened. He hated Abel because the work of Abel was righteous and his own work was evil. And the Lord is warning us that anybody that goes that direction, woe unto them. They've gone the way of Cain. But he gives us another man. What's that? the name of that other man? Tell me. 
Balaam. Look at uh, Jude verse 11. It says, Warn to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and they have run greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. You can tell from that verse, the problem of uh, Balaam was greed. He wanted to sell prophecy. He wanted to sell the gifts of God. He wanted to sell revelation. He wanted to sell prayer. Come, cost the people for me. Name the price I'll give you. All I want is that you'll come and prophesy negative prophecies so that all these children of Israel that occupy the land, you destroy them for me. Are they not religious people today? They use the Bible. Are they not religious people today? They use prayer. Are they not religious people today? They use worship. Are they not religious people today? They use their denomination to sell prayer, prosperity, money. And they perpetrate greed. And it says they go in the way of Balaam. As we look at Numbers, we're looking at Numbers. And we're reading here from chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. You'll see the problem of this man. God said, no, you will not go. No, you must not go. Because the people are blessed. But he still wanted the money. In any case, and so when the people came back, and they said, Balak has sent us again. That you should not refuse us. Anything you want, he will give it unto you. And eventually he prayed again and said, God, how about this now? Have you changed your mind? Some people think that God will change his mind. What he said 20 years ago, maybe he'll change his mind today. The doctrine of the word of God will learn 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Maybe God will change his mind. God does not change his mind. Am I right? He says, I am God, I change not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whatever we are taught in the word of God, days gone by, years gone by, that word is still standing even today. Come to Numbers chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 17. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come, therefore, I pray thee, cause me this people. Although he said, you know, superficially, whatever Balak will give me, even if he will give me the whole of his house, I cannot go beyond the words of the Lord. But he was actually greedy. The love of money was the problem. Look at verse 21. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Verse 22. And God, tell me, anger was kindled because he went. God's anger was kindled because he went. And the Lord sent an angel to confront him. The Lord sent an angel to rebuke him. The Lord sent an angel to tell him, your way is perverse before me. You're going the wrong direction. You're going in a way that God has not ordained. Now, before we finish about it, Balaam, how about you? You're looking for job and you want to get money in the wrong way. Bribery and corruption. And you're looking for something, you know, and the Lord has said, that's not the way. You must follow the way of righteousness, the highway of holiness, and the unclean shall not pass over that. And then you say, well, but I must get a job. But I must get a wife. I must get this. I must get that. And you're going the way of Balaam. I pray God will deliver you tonight in Jesus' name. And let's look at Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 2, and you see the problem of the man, the problem of many people today, religious people today, even preachers and pastors and bishops or whoever they are, because of that greed, they, they, they pursued for money, the love of money will not allow them to serve the Lord. I pray you will serve the Lord in spirit and in truth without covetousness and without greed without the love of money we're looking at second peter chapter 2 and here we're looking at verse 12 it says in verse 12 but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken 
and destroyed. He speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. He says, and they shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime sports they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you come to verse 15 which are forsaking the right way Balaam forsook the right way that's backsliding the people that know the way of salvation they forsake that they know the way of holiness they forsake that they know the way of righteousness they forsake that. They know the narrow way that leads to heaven. They forsake that. That's backsliding. That's exactly what Balaam did. I hope you are not there. I said, I hope you are not there. You are not in the way of unrighteousness, which are forsaking the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosa, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. That was his problem. And there are many people that still have that kind of problem today. Money, money, money. They'll do anything for money. What they cannot do for God, they'll do for money. And because of the pursuit of money, they forsake the way to heaven. And they forsake the way of righteousness. And they forsake the way that God himself arch ordained and now he tells us we're coming back to jude verse 11 in jude verse 11 it says one to them for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain sin of Corin. it has the third person there is a man that gathered people together in conspiracy in opposition, in resistance, resisting the word of God, resisting the leadership of the people of God, and wanting to, you know, position himself like, uh, you know, that as a self seeker, wanting to position himself in the place, in the way God has not given him. We're looking at Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16, and I'm reading from verse 1. Numbers chapter 16. The story of these uh, people that conspired against the people of God, against the leadership in the nation, the nation of Israel. Numbers chapter 16, we're reading from verse 1 now, Korah, the son of Ezra, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and Anna, and the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took the men. Now you see their pedigree, and you see their background. You see that they related to Levi, related to Aaron, related to Reuben. Then it goes on to say, and they also before Moses, with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. They already had position, they already had privilege, and they were serving, they were servants in the household of faith among the people of God. But no, they were not satisfied with that. They must compete with Moses. They must compete with Aaron. They wanted more authority. They wanted more power. They wanted more recognition. You know, that can destroy you. That's what destroyed Absalom. Because of the position they were looking for, that's how they were destroyed eventually. And then they began to look at verse 3, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, a seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them, wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Answer me now. Was it Moses that lifted up himself? Was it Aaron that chose himself? No. God chose them. And God placed them to be leaders over the people of Israel. But these conspirators and these rebels, they came and they said, Moses, you are taking too much upon you. And they said, Aaron, you are taking too much upon you. All the congregation is holy. And everybody were all equal. And there's no leadership. There's nobody to follow another person. 
because they wanted to win the people to themselves and eventually they perished and i pray that will not perish in jesus name and that's what the lord is warning us that's what the teaching of the word is coming to us and is saying this will go the way of cain and they go the way of uh, Balaam. And they go the way of Korah. They have a judgment upon them. Now, he begins to give us general description of the people that are following this way of Cain and Balaam and Korah. Come to Jude. We're looking at verse 12. It says, these are sports in your feast of charity. Number one, they are sports in the feast of charity. They are stains. The people that were not clean, their hands were not clean, their minds were not clean, their lifestyle was not clean. It goes on in verse 12, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. They were lawless, but they were fearless. They were not obeying the word of God, but they were fearless. They were carnal, but they were fearless. They feared nobody. They didn't fear God. They didn't fear the word of God. And they didn't fear even leadership in the church. And it goes on to say, clouds they are without water. Clouds they are. As they look up and see the cloud, they say, rain is coming. Water is coming. No, in their own case, they were empty. In their own case, they had nothing. Even in that cloud, come to that verse again, carried about with winds and there were trees whose fruits withered without fruits, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And look at those people. And look at the description. Number one, sports in the feast. Sports in the feast. We're looking at Second Peter. In Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, sports, they were sports. That means they were actually defiled and they, were, they had stain in their lives. In Second Peter chapter 2 verse 13, it says in verse 13, I shall receive the reward of righteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Sports, they are and blemishes. Sports, they are and blemishes the lord wants the church without blemish and without sport and without wrinkle and these ones come in they refuse to get saved they refuse to get sanctified they refuse to be holy and they refuse to be righteous and they're still there and they say i'm a member of the church i'm part of the church nobody can touch me nobody can drive me out i'm here i'm here and yet they will not get saved I'm here, I'm here, and yet there are spots and blemishes. I pray you will not be like that in Jesus' name. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 13, the spots. No change, no transformation, no conversion. Jeremiah chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 23. It says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots then? May ye also do good who are accustomed to do evil. The lives were evil. The lives were having blemish and blame. And they couldn't turn around to do what is right. I pray that your life will not be a life of blemishes and spots in Jesus' name. In Jude, verse Jude, that verse 12, it tells us something about them. Now, this number two, it says, When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Feeding themselves without fear. It's saying that they were fearless, but it was sinful. They were fearless, yet they were righteous. They were fearless, and yet they were not going to heaven. You know, there are people like that. There is the courage of the animal, the courage of a beast, the courage of the ignorant, and the courage of the sinner, the courage of the backslider. That's what these people are. Since they will not listen to anybody, they will not listen to God, they will not listen to the word of God, they will not listen to counseling, they are not going to listen to any pastor or any preacher. They were fearless in doing evil. And it says they were feeding themselves among the people of God. And yet it says they were without any fear. Uh, let, let's look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Sinful, fleshly, worldly. And you hear all the messages. And yet 
fearless. In Philippians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, talking about these people, it says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Why was Paul weeping for them? Because they will not change. He preached, no change. He counseled, no change. He taught, no change. He disciplined, no change. He did everything he could do, but no change because it says they were enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is, tell me. If you are there, I said, whose end is, tell me. Destruction. Whose God is there? belly whose glory is in their shame who oh, mind earthly things those who are the people fearless but sinful are you like that somebody says i don't fear anything don't mind him he's still a sinner he doesn't fear god he doesn't fear hell he doesn't fear judgment he doesn't fear any preacher. He doesn't fear any pastor. He doesn't fear any teacher of the word of God. He says, I can do anything I want to do. Anytime I want to do it. Go tell them, I don't fear anything or anyone. But it's a backslider. And if you die in that condition, that courage, that kind of fearlessness will take you to hellfire. God deliver you today. We come to Jude verse 12. It says, number three now, there are clouds, clouds they are without water. Clouds they are without water. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25. And we're reading from verse 14. Proverbs chapter 25. Reading from verse 14. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift, is like clouds and wind without rain. Is boasting himself. I have gift. I have talent. As if talent means salvation. As if the gift means salvation. The gift he has, he cannot live a holy life. The gift he has, he cannot resist temptation. The gift he has is still corrupt. The gift he has that he cannot overcome all the temptations and trials coming from the devil. I have gift and yet there's no victory. It says the people that boast of such talent and such gift and such ability, they are people that are like clouds without rain, without water. Number four about these people, we'll come back to Jude. Look at Jude. And we're looking at verse 12. The first thing about these unrighteous people and these uncontrollable self-seekers, it tells us in that uh, verse 12, it says they're carried about of wings. Carried about of wings. What does that mean? It's talking about every wind of doctrine. They are not stable. They don't have understanding of the way of salvation. And anything that comes, it's like wind blowing them. They are here today. They are there tomorrow. They believe that today. They believe that tomorrow. Because it tells us, look at Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 14, the people that are not steadfast in the will of God, in the way of God, in the word of God, the people that are not stable and they are not steadfast in the doctrine of the apostles, in the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, carried about with every wind of doctrine. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we be, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine carried about with every wind of doctrine they do not know the way of salvation they do not understand whosoever is born of god does not commit sin they do not understand if any man be in christ is a new creature all things are passed away and behold all things have become they do not understand that has delivered us from the enemy so that we might serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives and they do not have a straightforward understanding of the teaching of the word of god today they say i believe this today they believe tomorrow they believe another thing Today, they say, yes, the Bible is true. And then tomorrow, they say, well, there's a part of the Bible I don't know. I don't know how to interpret that one. I don't know whether it is correct or not. They are not stable. And it's talking about these people. It says, woe unto them. 
They've gone the way of Cain. They've gone greedily after the error of Balaam. And then it also says that they perish in the gainsaying, in the opposition, in the resistance, and in the conspiracy of uh, Balaam. That's why it says we must not be like that. People that are tossed to and fro and blown here and there by every wind of doctrine, by the sleight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wage to deceive. Come back to Jude. In verse 12, he's been talking about these people. He gives a general description. Number one, he says, there are sports in your feast of charity. Number two, he says, they feed, uh, they feed themselves without fear. They're sinful. They're full of self. They are worldly, and yet they say they are fearless. And then number three, they are clouds without water. Number four, they are carried about with every wind of doctrine. Number five, they are trees without fruit. Look at that. It says trees whose fruit withereth without fruit. And you remember the word of God? The axe is laid to the root of the tree. And every tree that beareth no fruit, he'll cut down and throw into the fire. And he's talking about the people that profess. They have the profession. As if we're children of God were believers but they do not have the fruit the fruit of the spirit the love and the joy and the peace and the long suffering and the meekness and the gentleness and the temperance the self-control they do not have the faithfulness towards god and yet they are professing their children of god look at them in titus chapter one titus chapter one i'm reading here from verse 16 titus chapter 1, we're reading from verse 16, they profess that they know God. That's profession, that's talk of mouth, that's empty testimony. They cannot uh, back that testimony up. It says they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Ep unto every good work reprobate. What's going to happen to such people? The people that profess that they know God, and yet there's no fruit. The people that say they have repented, and there's no fruit of repentance. And you cannot tell whether this fellow ever even went, entered any Bible-believing church. Because his life is still like, you know, the life of the people in the world. Look at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 6. It tells us what the Lord will do. It says in Luke chapter 13, verse 6, it speaks also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and she came and sought fruit thereon and found none. God is always looking at our lives, and is looking at your life. He wants to know whether there is fruit there. You have repented, where is the fruit? You are born again, where is the fruit? You are a child of God, where is the fruit? You say, I have the Spirit, and it bears witness with my heart. I'm a child of God, where is the fruit of the Spirit? What's the change of your life? What you're doing today, that's what you did yesterday. Your life today, that's what it was last year. Your language today, that's what you search last year. There's no change at all. There's no improvement and there's no transformation. And the Lord is saying, those people that do not have fruit, look at verse 7. It says in verse 7, Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking, seeking what? Tell me out loud seeking fruit of this fig tree and find none cut it down why cumbereth it the ground that is why is he taking the nutrients from the ground in vain you hear the bible study why are you hearing the bible study you come to the service while you are the service and you read the bible why are you reading the bible you pray and we're praying for you why are we praying for you where is the evidence of all the revival time what's the evidence of all the bible study time where is the evidence of all those retreats what's the evidence of all those conferences what's the evidence of i'm following the lord i belong to deep and he says where is the evidence he's looking for fruit i pray there'll be fruit in our lives
the fruit of redemption and the fruit of salvation and the fruit of righteousness. We hear about sanctification, holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. We hear what other people do not hear. We read what other people have not read. And we hear messages that are deeper than what other people are hearing. Are we different from the people? Or are we still following the way of Cain? and the way of Balaam, and the way of Korah, that's what he's saying. He's saying that these people want to them because they're trees without fruit. I'm looking at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm reading here from verse 6. John chapter 15. We're looking at verse 6. If a man abide not in me, if a man abide not in Christ, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. He's saying that the trees that do not have any fruit, they're only meant for, fire, for the fire, they're firewood. They're meant for hell, and they're meant for judgment forever and ever. That's why it's calling upon us that we'll not hear the word of God in vain. We'll not study the Bible in vain. The study will search our hearts, will saturate our hearts, and will turn us around, and then there'll be real salvation. It will happen to every one of us. We're looking at Jude. I'm coming to verse 12. Jude verse 12, and it talks about these people. Uh, this is terrible. Look at this. In verse 12, he has spoken about, number one, sports in the feast. Number two, he speaks about without fear, even though they were sinners. Number three, he talks about clouds without water. Number four, he talks about they have been, they've been carried about of winds. Number five, there were trees without fruit. Number six now, look at that verse 12. It says they are twice dead. Twice dead. What, what's that about? Twice dead. Look at this. Naturally, a sinner is dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. And then he professes to be born again. Praise the Lord, I come alive. Praise the Lord, I have the life of Christ in me now. And then he went back again into the original position of spiritual death. Twice dead. The people that uh, you know came to the Lord and later they go back into the world again. And now it says they're twice dead. We're looking at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Uh, you need to mark this in your Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Uh, I'm looking at verse 6. I'm waiting for you to open your Bible. Have you seen the passage? I'm waiting for you. I said, have you seen the passage? Oh, we're here to study the Bible, and you are the one studying the Bible. I already, I read all the references myself. I already know the references. Here you are. You are to study, and therefore you need to open the Word of God and see what I have seen. Are you there now? First Timothy chapter five. I'm looking at verse six. We're going to read it together. One, two, three, go. You, you know what some people say? My Christianity is in my heart. I know what I believe. You may not see it. You may not see it. You may think I'm worldly. You may think I'm living in pleasure. But I know myself. I know I'm all right. No, you are not all right. She that liveth in pleasure, the pleasure of sin, the pleasure of worldliness, the pleasure of all the rituals of the world, and the pleasure of following the things of the world. The only thing that makes her happy is when she can put on all those other things and paint this and paint that and then look like the world and look like Jezebel and then she's happy you know I match the people of the world I compare with the people of the world when I go I don't take my own Christianity too far because you know when I appear in the public all those people they can come and stand by my side here and they will know that I am as beautiful as they are you are twice dead if you were born again before, you've come back into sin. Because it says, she in particular, talking about the woman, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she's still alive physically, but she's dead spiritually. You'll come back to the Lord today. All those things that the Lord has condemned, and the Lord says, this is not right. Why has the Bible given us those things? 
First Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. Why is it there? Why has the Lord told us that this is wrong and this is wrong? That women will not adorn themselves with costly apparel and not with gold and not with silver, not with all those things. If that's not the word of God, the spirit of God writing that, why is that in the Bible? It's in the word of God. There are people that close their eyes to that in the Bible. If they come across it, they close it very quickly. Uh -uh, no, I don't believe that. I don't accept that. Because I must live in pleasure while I am here. And it says you are twice dead. And men as well. Do you see all those men? You know the way they behave. They look at the models they see on the billboard. They don't look at the model of the word of God. They look at the things they see outside. You know the television and the, and the screen is now on the street. And then they look at that and they say I like that. I want to be like that. You want to be like who? Like unbelievers. Like the sinners, like the people that do not know the Lord, it says, he or she that lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. I pray God will deliver us. I was waiting for his son, Lord, tell me a good amen. amen. Uh, look at look at this in Second Peter. Second Peter, I'm looking at chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. I'm reading from verse twenty. Second Peter chapter two. For if after the for, for it says, for if after they had escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, what was that that salvation? They escaped the pollution of the world. They escaped the corruption of the world. They escaped all those, all the things, the worldliness in the world. It says, after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Look at this. They are, tell me, again entangled therein. That's the backsliding. They were free before. They were set free. They were cleansed. They were washed, and they were not having any of those worldly things anymore at that time. But he says now, and they again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse than with them, than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It has happened unto them. According to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit. What's the next word? Again. They were free before. They said they were born again. But now they are backslidden. They go back to their own vomit and the soul that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. That's why it says they are twice dead. Come back to Jude. In Jude, this verse 12, it looks at number 7 now. Plucked up by the roots. Plucked up by the roots. What's that talking about? It's talking about God plucking them up. Saying, you don't feed the kingdom. You don't feed my house. You don't feed my temple. We're looking at Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Plucked up by the roots. And this is what God himself says he will do. To the people that will not remain in righteousness. Will not remain in holiness. In Second Chronicles chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 19. It tells us in verse 19, it says, But if ye turn away, if ye backslide, if you turn back to sin, if ye turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I plug them up by the roots out of the land which I have given them. You see that? It says, if they backslide, if they say, well, I just come to Bible study, I just hear the message, I just hear the preaching, but I will still do what I will do in any case. 
I will still go my way and they do not have the grace to live in righteousness and they will kind of resist the word of God coming to them. It says, if they say they are born again, if they say they are my children and then they say, we're still going to go worship idol, we're still going to go and do that which is wrong, the Lord said, I'll plug them up out of the land. I'll take them off out of the land. That means I'll not count them as my people anymore. And that's what he's talking about when he says in Jude, in Jude from verse 11, one to them. Because they have gone in the way of Cain, and they have run greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and they are perishing against saying of Corim. They are sports in your feast of charity. When he feeds themselves, when he feeds with you, with uh, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruits wither it without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. But the grace of God is available today. If you return to the Lord, He will forgive you. But when He forgives you, you have to take away all those things of the world and you have to forsake all those evil things that you love more than you love the Lord all those things you forsake and you say Lord I'm going to be totally completely entirely unreservedly committed unto you and then the Lord will receive you in Jesus name point number two now the peril and the punishment of unrepentant souls the peril and the punishment of unrepentant souls. Uh, repentance is a wonderful thing. When you repent in the sight of the Lord, He loves that. He appreciates that. But if you don't uh, repent, you're just, you know, I'm just part of them. I'm just coming. No, no. There must be a change. There must be a transformation. Let's look at this in verse 13. In verse 13, it says, Reaching waves of the sea, forming out their own shame. And wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. It's talking about the people that really they are not dependable. You cannot tell where they belong. You cannot tell where they stay. And you cannot tell who they believe. You cannot tell how solidly wedded to the Lord they are. Look at what he says about them, number one. They're reaching waves of the sea. Reaching waves of the sea. What's that? Rage. Anger. And it's like the storm coming out of the sea. See them with their wives when their anger comes on them. And see them with their husbands when the rage, the anger comes upon them. See them in the place of work when they tremble and shake with rage and anger. And see them in the church when they are angry at somebody. The man does not stammer. The man does not stammer. But when that rage and anger comes upon him like the wave of the sea, he'll be stammering. He'll be shaking. He will, you will not recognize him anymore. And then after he cools, now you see... My friend, when are you going to be born again? When are you going to become a child of God? You say, I'm born again, I'm born again. But you're like the raging waves of the sea. You're stormy. You rage. You, are, you get angry. And when your wrath comes, whatever appears to your mind at that time, that's what you'll do. You do not know father or mother. When you get angry, and you do not know husband, you do not know darling or honey or wife when you get angry. You do not know a little child when you get angry. And the grace of God is not there. It's talking about the people reaching waves of the sea. I pray that that rage, God will take away. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. When he lives in our hearts, there will be peace. The storm will be over. The rage will be over. The anger will be over. And you find some people, the way they will talk. When nothing comes upon them, if Christ came at that time, what do you spend eternity? You say you are a child of God. The coolness and the meekness and the, and the serenity of the Lord, the tranquility of the Lord is not there. Always angry, always angry. And what are you angry about? We come to Bible study and the joy of the Lord is our strength. And the man is angry at the Bible study. And we come to worship the Lord. 
and we come to worship Jesus Christ who says I am meek and lowly and the fellow is angry in the worship and here we are in the fellowship of the children of God and we're happy to be in the presence of God and the peace of God raised in our hearts and the fellow is angry and we're asking oh, what's the problem what's the problem the problem is there's no salvation there's no regeneration there is no change of life and what's he angry about if you analyze it okay tell me what's your problem what are you angry about and he tells you the thing evaporates into the thin air it's about nothing it's about nothing this man you'll kill yourself with anger and go to hell a change will happen today somebody there said a change is coming today look at proverbs proverbs chapter 14 proverbs chapter 14 and i'm reading here from verse 16 proverbs chapter 14 and we're looking at verse 16 look at what it says a wise man feareth and departed from evil but tell me ah i said tell me out loud the fool rages that's like saul that's like saul Saul, what's your problem? It's an evil spirit that came on him. And see the javelin in his hand. And he gets the sight of David. David that killed Goliath. David that helped the whole nation. The anger came on that fellow. And Saul, rage came upon him. He threw javelin at him. Jonathan, where's David? Oh, David asked me that there's a feast in their family. And he asked permission from me that, you know, I, I'll excuse him. And I said, all right, he could go. Your child of a perverse woman, rage came upon him. And then Jonathan said, Daddy, what has this man done? You're asking me that? He took javelin and he wanted to kill his own child. Rage. Nebuchadnezzar. He called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sincere people, peace-loving people, children of God, servants of the Lord. Come on here. Is it true that you'll not worship my idol? Cool down, Nebuchadnezzar. Want to worship the God of heaven, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Ah, if you hear that sound of the cornet again, and you fall down and worship, okay, well... If you don't, he forgot himself. Who is that God? People who are reaching, they forget themselves. They may say they are members of the church. They may say they are workers in the church. They may say they are singers in the church. When the rage comes, they forget the honor we ought to have towards God. And then he said, who is that God that will deliver you out of my... Okay. If you talk like that, it's not for us to answer you. There is a God in heaven, he will answer you. He will answer them. I said he will answer them. Yeah. Cool down. If you want to show you that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, all that reaching, all that anger, all that evil sin rising up in your heart, it says it's the mark of the people on their way to hell. You will not go to hell. It says, the fool rages and is confident. Then he tells us, look at Jude, verse 13. Jude, verse 13. It says, foaming out their own shame. Foaming out their own shame. You see, when you are quiet, people will think you are wise. When you are quiet, people will think that you are a strong person. That nothing, nothing will jolt you. But when you open that mouth, sometimes, allow me to use the language, big mouth. And some shameful things are coming out of that mouth. Vocabularies that we have not heard since we became born again. Vocabularies from dictionary. Bad words, terrible words that we have forgotten. I've forgotten some of those words because I don't, uh, you know, I don't live in the midst of the people that use that language. And this man, a church man, this woman, a church woman, she brings out that language. You are shocked. You shrink. 
And you say, what? Sister so-and-so, uh-uh, don't call her sister. Foaming out her own shame. Brother so-and-so, don't call her brother. Don't call him brother. Foaming out the shame. It's like epilepsy. It's a spirit. And the child falls down. And the foam is coming out. And it's a shameful scene. But the boy does not know anything because it's a spirit of epilepsy. And there are people like that. When they foam it out, they forget that we are in the midst of believers. Others are listening. Others are there. But the foam is coming out in any way. It's a mark of backsliding. It's a mark of control by an evil spirit. I pray that that control will stop tonight. We become gentle, we become meek, we become lowly, we become loving and lovable. And then all the fighting, all the aggression and all the foaming and all those evil things, they are cleansed off from our lives in Jesus' name. And then he calls them wandering stars, wandering stars. That is, they're not stable. And there are some people ought to be here at the Bible study. They have gone to another place, they are wandering. If they hear there's something in the valley, they wander into the valley. There's something in the mountain, they wander into the mountain. They hear that something, they, may, they wander to the... Uh, they, they are not stable, you cannot find them. And their seat is always vacant and empty. But, you know, the people who are children of God, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I continue. I said, I continue. I said, I continue. I don't wander about like wandering stars. You will not wander about then your life will be stable. Your Christian life will be stable. Your Christian profession will be stable. You'll be predictable. we we'll say she's always there. Find out. He's always there. Find out. But the people don't wander from house to house and they wander from uh, this place to that place. I'm looking at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 12. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And without, they learn to be idle, wandering from house to house. Wandering from house to house. Wandering stars. You will not be like that. And then it now tells us, look at Jude, look at Jude. I'm looking at that verse 13. It tells us the end of such people, the judgment of such people, the punishment of such a people. It tells us uh, they are wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. There are people that act and behave, they don't think about hell. They live their lives. They don't think about the judgment day. They go here. They go there. They do anything. They say anything. They act anyhow. They behave anyhow. They never think that a judgment day is coming. And Jude is saying, these are the people. It says, I'm warning you about them. Because they are wandering stars. They are fo they're forming out their own shame. And these are people that are they rich, they are angry, they have wrath, they have anger, terrible anger. And it says for them, the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Here we're reading from verse 10. Revelation chapter 14 verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up. How long? How long? You know, if you trade in anger, you trade in evil, you trade in sin. You trade in rebellion. It's like, that's your full-time job, always to get angry. That's your full-time job, always to be worldly. That's your full-time job, always to resist and reject the word of God. Remember, there is eternity. It says forever and ever that the blackness of darkness is reserved for them forever and ever. 
analyze what you are angry about analyze what you are fighting about and ask yourself is it worth it for you to go to prison for one year for this thing is it worth it knocking your head on the wall i will die for this what do you want to die for i will fight this out what are you fighting for I'm going to oppose this with my very life. Hey, your life is more precious than that. What are you trying to do? If you were to go to prison for this action for 10 years, you like that? For 50 years, you like that? Now think, it's not just 50 years. It's not just 100 years. It says the smoke of their torment has sent this up forever and ever and it says and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image whoever whosoever receiveth the mark of his name i'm looking at chapter 20 verse 10 chapter 20 of revelation and we're looking at verse 10 and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night tell me forever and ever forever and ever you know there are some things that some people do and they say well this one this is pleasure if it's the kind of pleasure that god condemns are you ready to go to prison? Let's even talk in human language. Are you ready to go to prison for the rest of your life because of this pleasure? If your life remains 30 years, 40 years, are you ready to leave society and go into the prison for the next 40 years because of this now? Are you ready because of this pleasure you are talking about? This revenge you are talking about? This rage you are talking about, and this, uh, you know, uh, teeth for tart and stone for stone, I'm going to take the pound of flesh. Are you ready to go and spend eternity in hellfire forever and ever just for this? My husband did that, and I learned that she went to a woman. Uh -huh. I didn't want to do this before, but because my husband did that, I'm going to show him. I don't like this. I don't want to do it. But because I want to use it to punish him. You are using it to punish him, but you are going to spend eternity in hellfire. My wife did that. Okay. You know how to do that. I will show you. I will not hide my own. You are trying to hide your own. I will do this to pinch you. And it will pain you. You've gone to a man to commit something. I am going to a woman. This one you will know. It's not like I'm going to hide it. I'm going to do it. I don't want to do it. But I'll do it to punish you. You will do it to punish her. But you will go to hell. Are you ready for that? And it says forever and ever. I will not go to hell for anybody. If anybody wants to go to hell, let her go to her hell. If anybody wants to go to hell, let him go to his own hell. Me, my, my place is in heaven. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you unto myself. I'm waiting for Jesus to take me to heaven. I said, I'm waiting for Jesus to take me to heaven. I will not go to hell. You will not go to hell in Jesus' name. All the ways of the world, you cancel them, you suspend them. You say, I'm going to follow the Lord. You will follow the Lord and nobody will drag you to hell in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the mongers and the sorcerers, witchcraft and the idolaters, and all liars. How many liars? Tell me out loud. Uh, you, you know there are some people, they don't understand the Bible. They say, I just, I don't, want, I don't like telling lies. I'm a clean person, a righteous person. But this one, I'm just going to tell this lie to tease so and so. And then he tells a lie. And then we'll say, you say you're a brother. You say you're a sister. This is a lie. I just told the lie to tease you. You want to tease somebody and go to hell? Other people say, well, 
I'm going to do this. If, because they even preach against it. I want to show that man. The more he talks about telling a lie, I didn't want to tell lies before. But just to show him that whatever he says, I'm going to do the opposite. You want to prove that you are so strong. And because we read the Bible, reading the Bible and telling you that all lies shall go to the lake of fire, reading the Bible makes you want to tell a lie. Reading the Bible gets you angry. And then you say, okay, because they say that, and they say they will, if you're a worker, they say they will discipline you if you tell a lie. I want to do it. I want them to discipline me. So that the church will see I am fighting with the pastor. You are fighting with your soul. You will go to hell. All liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. That's the word of God. You don't play with something that will throw you into the fire. I will not go into that fire. Look at this. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and then it goes on to say and the sorcerers and the idolaters and tell me tell me out loud if you are not afraid somebody will detect you tell me all liars shall have their parts in the lake which burn it with fire and brimstone which is a second death look up here there are people that tell lies to avoid punishment you're a little child you've done something wrong daddy or mommy or teacher principal asked you who did this if i say i did it they might give me two k's that's all right but if you told a lie if you're going to get to heaven, you'll still go back there and say, Sir, I told you a lie the other day. You cannot go away from that. If you told a lie and you now realize you don't want to go to hell, you still go back and tell the truth. You still go back and say, That was a lie I told. It wasn't the right thing. And so, if you're still going to tell the truth eventually, you might as well tell the truth right now. Because if you don't, all lies shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. I pray that real conversion, real salvation will be ours in Jesus' name. I'm coming to point number three now. In point number three, that's the perversion and the profanity of ungodly sinners. The, prof the uh, perversion and the profanity of ungodly sinners. We're looking at Jude, verses 15 and 16. It says uh, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, those who are speaking against the Lord. He is the one to open the gate of heaven for us and to speak against him. He is the one to forgive and to forget our sins and to speak against him. He is the one to give us inheritance in heaven and to speak against him. The ungodly, the unrighteous, and their unrepentant. It says in verse 12, These are murmurers and complainers. Murmurers and complainers walking after their own lost and with their and their mouth speaketh great swelling words having men's persons in admiration because of advantage ungodly what's going to happen to the ungodly someone in some one i'm reading from verse four someone reading from verse four the ungodly it says, the ungodly are not so, they are not like the righteous, but like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly, tell me, shall perish. We're looking at First Peter chapter 4, the ungodly. First Peter chapter 4. And here we're reading from verse 17. First Peter chapter 4. We're reading from verse 17. 
In First Peter chapter 4 verse 17, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the age of them that obey not the gospel of God be? What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? If the righteous scarcely be saved, if the righteous, if the saved, if the one that's a child of God scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? That's why you don't gamble with your salvation. You don't gamble with your life. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 5. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of, tell me, the ungodly, the people that perished, the people that were judged in the time of Noah, the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 5. Chapter 3 of Second Peter, verse 5. But this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and they are standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in storm, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men perdition of ungodly men and in the last days the days in which we are living you find ungodly people will continue in their ungodliness but those of us who are following the lord and those of us who want to get to heaven ungodliness will be washed away from our lives they will live a life of righteousness a life of holiness and a life of godliness. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous time shall come, dangerous time shall come, difficult time shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own self. Those are not worshipping God, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. The people that think that it's fashionable to be disobedient to our parents in the Lord, to our fathers and mothers in the Lord, they think that's the right thing. They think when you're rebellious like that, you're proving tough. You're proving that you're uncontrollable. You're proving that nobody can direct you. That's the way of the world. And it's the attitude of people in the last days. They are unthankful, they are unholy, they are ungodly, and they are disobedient to parents without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent fears, despisers of them, of those that are good. They are traitors and heady. They are high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Lovers of football, more than lovers of God. Mothers, lovers of games, more than lovers of God. Lovers of the pleasure of the flesh, more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof from such, tell me. From such, say it aloud. Turn away, turn away. Your heart should agree with that. If you're on your way to heaven, and if you want to see the glory of God, finally, it says for those that have the form of godliness, but they have the power of transformation, it says from such, turn away. And then he tells us about other things there. And then he tells us in verse 12, ye, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer 
persecution. But evil men and seducers, evil men and seducers, Cain, evil men and seducers, Balaam, evil men and seducers, Korah, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou. I will continue. I said I will continue. You continue the salvation of the Lord, in the righteousness of the Lord, in the new life that we have in Christ, in the meekness and the peace of mind and the gentleness and the love. It says, but continue in the things that thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And as we continue, the trumpet will sound any moment from now. You'll be there. I will be there. I will see the Lord face to face and live in heaven forever and ever in Jesus' name. While the other people that said, no, I don't want to get saved. I don't want to be holy. I don't want to be righteous. They will be in hell, fire forever and ever. I will be on the right hand side. I will get to heaven. The Lord confirm it in your life in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has taught us the word very clearly today. And you will not say you don't understand. Yes, you understand. The Lord is telling us that we need to now call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. I want to be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Here am I. I want to turn away from everything that is evil. The way of the uncontrollable self-seekers. The way of the evil evil people, the way of the backsliders. I'm turning away from that and I want to give myself entirely, wholeheartedly, all my heart, all my soul, all my mind. I want to serve the Lord. I don't want to go the way of evil and I don't want to perish with the people who are perishing. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I will serve you. Make up your mind, you'll serve the Lord.